Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, just because it is summer and we daydream about beach trips or vacation schedules does not mean that school is not in session, at least the business of running the campus. This is the most widely watched program on regional business and public policy seen across North and South Carolina for more than two decades. I'm Chris William, and thanks so much for joining us again. As the share of public funding for higher education gets skinnier and skinnier, school administrators certainly need to up their fundraising game, but being more resourceful and creative is just as, if not more crucial. Later on this program, as he leaves his post, we will debrief App State Chief Ken Peacock about where higher ed needs to focus. In a moment, we start this week's dialogue with South Carolina Upstate Alliance CEO Hal Johnson and Charlotte's Communities and Schools exec, Molly Shaw. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded July 15, 2013. On this week's program, Hal Johnson III of the Upstate South Carolina Alliance, Molly Shaw from Communities and Schools of Charlotte-Mecklenburg, and special guest, Dr. Kenneth Peacock, Chancellor of Appalachian State University. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Molly, good to have you on the program. Hal, welcome back. Thanks, Chris. It's all very exciting. Happy summer. Um, you know, we're going to talk a lot about education this time. Uh, before we do that, let me, let me get your take on something. We have talked about transportation and infrastructure spending for both North and South Carolina. This has been crucial, and I know you know this, that it's crucial to economic development. In June, beginning of the summer, the South Carolina State House did pass some significant, I think it's fair to say, significant funding for transportation at the tune of about a half a billion dollars in public debt. When does that start to show up in works projects, Hal? Well, it starts showing up immediately. And so as, as the funds are available, uh, then they have the bonding capacity. So those projects are for strength and most important and they will take off immediately. So w what, what does a half a billion dollars do for a state like South Carolina? Bes besides fixed roads and bridges, what can this really do? Well, I think it creates jobs. Uh, and when you think about job creation inside your state, uh, when you think about the amount of tourism that we have, it makes our roads safer. Uh, and it gives people the confidence inside our state that we've got an incredible transportation infrastructure. You know, what, Molly, one of the other big, <laughs> I'm just telling you this like you don't know this, but one of the other big policy issues that's been debated besides infrastructure has been education. And that's been, you know, that has been not without a lot of emotion around it. It, it. Communities and schools, among many other NGOs and organizations that are in and around the K through 12 education process across the states, um, you've heard a lot of the debate and seen a lot of the news stories that we've seen in North Carolina about the, the, the Republican-controlled legislature and also the Republican-controlled executive branch. How does some of the dialogue around education affect how you plan, how you execute K-12 through support that you do? So Governor McCrory has made it clear that education is a priority and it's a good thing when any leader um, of any legislature is saying that education is important. He's also hired Eric Gukian as his top education advisor, um, who was previously in Charlotte running New Leaders for New Schools, somebody who has a deep understanding of all educational issues. So that's a really positive 
uh, sign. Mm -hmm. I think that we'll learn a lot about what's going to happen in education over the course of the next year. There have been, it's been a very busy legislative session and things that have happened in terms of what may seem unconnected to education, like unemployment, have in fact really, um, really changed the way that our families uh, who need support are able to access that kind of support. So mm -hmm. at a place like Communities and Schools, where we're working to support and connect resources to almost 40,000 kids and case manage 7,000 students, many of whom live in poverty, um, things like dropping the amount of unemployment support that families receive means that there's a direct impact to the kind of support and the way students can be educated. And, and, and not to push you on this, and I don't want you to have to defend or, or, or uh, put out your own political uh, views out here. Molly, how do you, given some of the dialogue around... Uh, well, there was a New York Times op-ed piece that, that was crashing on North Carolina because it said the Republicans mm -hmm. are dismantling a lot of the education. What, I mean, when you read these stories, when you, do you see the effects of what is going on, what is being debated in Raleigh around Moral Monday and some of the issues that come up? Do you see these effects happening? Or are you taking, it sounds like you're taking, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, you know, longer term view of what is going to happen in education? Yeah, I think it's very difficult to say that we see the effects today. Uh, we still don't even have the budget for next year. Um, we should have that in the coming days and weeks, and that will tell us a lot about where things have ended up and, mm -hmm. and what, uh, what the leaders in Raleigh are prioritizing. I think accountability is a really big focus uh, for legislators today, and I think choice is a big focus. And so both of those things can be great mm -hmm. for the educational system, but it's the way in in which those individual laws are structured. And, and that has a lot to do, you know, I think there's a lot to be seen. Uh, we've got we've to look and, and see what happens over the coming year before we can really draw conclusions about what will happen. So yeah. I think there are good things that can come from it, but I do think that there are a lot of concerns as well. You know how, I know South Carolina is, is not immune to this kind of dialogue. We, sure. we, matter of fact, we had a, an education summit, well, self-promotive, we had an education summit in February in Columbia. And it was is just as polarizing about the way forward in K through 12 education in the Upstate. How does how does that dialogue play out in the Upstate? Well, the dialogue plays out uh, right now as we're looking to attract new jobs, as we're attracting jobs. We've been very successful over the last couple of years of bringing companies in. There's a real communication between industry. And education. But let, let me stop you there, not mm -hmm. to interrupt you, but uh, you know, folks that are in your association will say, but we've got this huge skills gap. We right. have kids that are coming out of school that don't even want to be trained in the industries that we have That's the right. best paying jobs That's right. in. It's, it's, it, it's huge, and it's not just in South Carolina, it is a global effect. I just got back from China, and they're having the same types of problems in their own education system. So it, it is a global issue as we see the jobs that are coming back to America or the jobs that we're able to bring to our regions. We have to adjust what our education systems are teaching and what industry and the jobs available in our communities are. Yeah, what you're nodding over there when we were talking about the skills gap. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's clearly a reality. Um, and I think that there's a lot that can happen and is beginning to happen in the K through 12 system that can assist with that mm -hmm. piece. I mean, it's about restructuring the way we think about post-secondary success. Mm -hmm. And I think in this country, we've become experts at helping students understand the importance of college, but we haven't necessarily focused on the importance of jobs. And so it's about finding early on what are interests and what are passions that every individual child has, and then creating a, an infrastructure it, within the K through 12 system that helps them understand how those interests and passions connect to future jobs. But, and, and not to be oppositional, hold on one second, not to be oppositional, but how do, you, how do you be a change agent in a system and how do you get that done, Molly, before you reach the tipping point that, oh yeah, North Carolina has a huge skills gap, but uh, maybe Virginia doesn't and maybe we lose more industry. Uh, I yeah. think it's a con I think you have to it all starts with a conversation Absolutely. and it's and it's education Molly and I talked about this earlier conversation it, conversation her. between parents between educators between the companies that are in your community and it, it, we're not just talking about manufacturing on skills gaps we have many skills gaps inside the medical fields and and other places 
So it has to be a conversation of not just what's available today, but what is needed in the future. And, and industry will tell us that. They're willing to tell us that. They're willing to invest in it. And that's the key is if, we're, if we will allow them in, that's how ICAR has been so extremely successful, is its whole program was built around the needs of an industry, not what Clemson wanted to do. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was built, the fact that BMW needed an automotive engineer that doesn't exist. That's why it's so successful. So we need to take those, that same model and put it into our education system starting at the very beginning. It, we have a couple seconds left. You get the last word on this. Well, I'd agree with Hal. I, I think that it's about, it's about a dialogue. It's about bringing the right players to the table and a diverse group of them. It's about making sure that industry is talking to community college, to other higher mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. uh, institutions, and to K through 12, and that there are plans that are being created. The, the promising thing about this conversation is that's already happening. Mm -hmm. Just in Charlotte Mecklenburg alone, there's something called college and career promise and that's something that is a partnership among all those groups okay uh thank you guys stay with us on the program we're going to keep it going next week on this program the lieutenant governor from the tar heel state dan forrest will be here and then in two weeks he is the new ceo at a place called rti that is research triangle institute they've had spectacular growth in their government contracts and we will find out what that means going forward. Wayne Holden will be on this program in two weeks. You know, there is something comfortable and decidedly old school, no pun intended, about our guest. Old school in that he genuinely connects with and is well-liked, genuinely well-liked, by faculty in the broader Western North Carolina community. So is it any wonder that many lament his imminent withdrawal? I will not say retirement, but withdrawal. <laughs> from running Appalachian. Joining us again is Appalachian State University Chancellor, Dr. Kenneth Peacock, uh, Mr. Chancellor, Dr. Chancellor, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris, it's great to be here. Um, I'm not gonna say retire, but so let's just talk about uh, the next change. But before you do that, when you look back on the last 30, 30 or 31 years, Dr. Peacock at Appalachian State, what, what one thing do you say, I'm so glad that happened on my watch? Well, I haven't been in the chancellor role for that long, but I think it's the pride in the institution that people, the graduates now, are very proud of Appalachian. And when I started there 30 years ago, you didn't see as many, these are really strange signs, you didn't see as many Appalachian t-shirts or A-pens that are out there. People didn't seem to really promote the value of that institution, and now they are. So there's great pride throughout North Carolina. Um, Appalachian graduates, and they're, pr they're promoting Appalachian. Well, and I know congratulations to you because mm. you have something to do with the mm. way that people feel about that, and we, you will be mm. missed there. I know, I know that, Dr. Peacock, but you're not gone yet. You know, we, we, we talked some at the beginning of the program about the opacity and the uncertainty about public budgets, and right. the UNC system is squarely in the middle of that with whatever politics is going on. Uh, Dr. Peacock, how do you plan going forward? How do you set priority? And how do you take your school in the right direction that gets people excited? Well, getting the priority is not really the administration's responsibility. You have to consult with and listen to the faculty and hear what their needs, their desires are, and where, where we should go. And that, that really, what's going on budget-wise, has challenged us to be able to set, let's articulate what it is that we want to be, not just what we are now, but what we want to be, which means change on campus, and that causes a lot of concern. Change is a great thing, however, it makes people a little uncertain at night as to what's going to be, will I have a job? And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, but we, it makes us really think about and listen carefully to what they're telling us from Raleigh as to what they want us to be and how we attain that, how can we can make them happy and how we really fulfill the the needs of our faculty and staff and the students. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how are you finding uh, industry partnerships in helping you either fill the gap, the budgetary gap, or direct the needs of some of your, uh, your professors and your faculty? How that's a challenge, but the, the, what we do is we try to articulate the goals, the strategic plan of Appalachian as we go to find, get that private support for all projects, you try to say, here's why we need it. Here is the benefit that it will make on the campus and in the lives of students at Appalachian State. And certainly programs, that's a big thing, support faculty, staff, and certainly support the students. These are tough times. Mm -hmm. As we talk about with the economy, 
you know, as Molly said a while ago, with young people that are coming um, and headed toward public higher education, they need that margin of excellence. They need that, that support, that academic support. And that gives them the feeling that there is confidence you know, in who they are. We just had a group of freshmen, incoming freshmen in our house about a week ago, and to hear what these young people were saying when I asked them just a rather flippant question, what's the most exciting thing that you've done in the past four months, the most exciting to you? And one young lady stood up in front of the room, so helping her with her communication skills, and she said, I helped with the Habitat for Humanity House, and I saw the family when they came in, and I realized I had made a difference. I want to continue to do that. that. The young people of today, they have a different mindset. If I had answered that question 40 years ago as a high school senior, it wouldn't have been anything like that. It's touching. Mm -hmm. Right. when you see that what they want to do. And so people, when they find out the quality of young persons, they want to support. They want, want to support the programs. So my challenge is to go out and articulate to them the needs and what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. wow. So when you, look, um, when, when you look in your mind ahead five, ten years, and you think about where does Appalachian want to be, you know, who do mm -hmm. you want to be, what do you see, what do you envision? I envision a stronger program in health sciences. You know, we're not trying to have a medical school by any means, but we started just a few years ago the College of Health Sciences, and we added to it the nursing program. In the last year, 100% of our nursing graduates passed the nursing exam. 100% have jobs in North Carolina. They're meeting the needs of our state. We need them here, so I see a stronger program. We can't start all these other things, so we have collaboration with Wake Forest Medical School. We'll be announcing a program in, in August that will be, I think, just um, a, a shaker for us on, on our campus that's here. So I see more programs along that nature. I see more entrepreneurship that we have. We have a program now in the College of Business, but we wanna get that entrepreneurship word and ideas, that creativity, into everything that we do. I want it to be part of the DNA of Appalachian, and I think it will be. You know, speaking of DNA, right at the core of the DNA was Appalachian taught, was it was educating educators. You, right. you taught mm -hmm. teachers, a teacher school. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, do you think the UNC system, and I, and I use that broadly, not just Appalachian, but do you think the UNC system is doing a satisfying enough job to have teachers prepared for what teachers need to be doing now in a very critical time in K through 12? I think that in the heart they do, but I'd like to see some in the action. I want the Teaching Fellows Program back. I have seen the difference it's made in the lives of young people. I know of their dedication when they go out in the classroom and the difference that they make. So I think at the heart of it, and I was pleased as what was said a while ago, it, 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 it is when our chief executive officer says education is at the core of what I want to accomplish, that in itself has value, that has merit, but I just want to see a little more action put behind those words. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Economic development has really two core focuses in the future. The first is human capital, the second is physical infrastructure mm -hmm. and land building sites. But focus on the human capital side, it's what we truly market as our workforce. How do you see the education system all the way from the, the primary education all the way up to postgraduate changing or adapting to what the needs of workforce will be? I think the point there is to try and get young people to realize in all, in all of their academic career, you know, as you said when we were offset a while ago, you know, people tend to pick the location first, love the location, and then decide, I want a job there. Mm -hmm. Um, so we need to tell them to you know, focus a little bit more on the right job for them. There are many locations throughout North and South Carolina that are great places to live. Mm -hmm. They can find that, that place to live, but find that job you know, first. Get started. You know, decide what you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's the key to getting them on board, motivated when they're in, in that higher education experience, and then go out and find it and make a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Will. You and I had talked a little, a little earlier about retention. Right. And what ideas, what sort of creative thinking do you have around how we can continue not just to give access to college to students, but to ensure that they are staying in college and graduating in a timely manner? 
Molly, I'm not sure this is any big secret, but I tell you that one of the things that I have found at Appalachian in my 30 years, these young people need to know that they're cared for. They need to know somebody really values them for who they are. Yeah. And like you say, it's more than just the access to it. We started a program several years ago called Access Scholarship, which provides a full financial ride for young people that come from families and where the income level is at federal poverty and below. But just getting them on campus, you know, that's not enough. They're coming, they're coming to a situation where they're not really as comfortable as perhaps others could be. So give them that little bit of a additional attention. Provide them with that guidance, with those counselors to help them with their classes. They'll catch on and they'll move on. Some have done amazing jobs. And so it's that access, but then that attention that comes in there. S sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt mm -hmm. you, uh, right. Dr. Pika. Uh, uh, UNC System President Tom Ross sat in that chair right there and said that, uh, he said, not everyone should have a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question to you is this, how, as, as one of the main college presidents, executives, uh, wh what is the responsibility of a school like Appalachian State to know that not everyone should have a four-year degree, but our responsibility to those kids is X. What is X? Our responsibility to those kids from high school and what, what Molly is doing is to help them find what they wish to do, what, what their goals in life are, to be that, that kind of leader. But let them know that they are greatly valued and they are needed. Their skills are needed in North and South Carolina to find out what it is for them. They may not need that four-year education. Now, I certainly respect and, and agree with the president, but I, th I don't think any young person that has the opportunity of that four-year education, I don't think that they are harmed by doing that if they come. I am, you know, I'm a liberal arts person. Mm -hmm. I just think that's important. I think to teach young people to think, to reason, and to communicate are key. The first job that they get when they get out of school is not the job they're gonna keep, they're gonna change jobs. They'll also need that ability to think and to reason and communicate regardless you know of mm -hmm. what we what we do so I think in high school we need to work with them closer to say you know what is it you hope to do what do you want to be and have them think outside the box the students that come to Appalachian from some challenged uh, past come with great skills so we need to do a great job in our um, admissions program to analyze what they have done you know, it's not just an SAT score. It's not just a grade point average. You look at their demonstrated leadership skills. What have they done? Where have they shown mm -hmm. that interest to make the big difference? And one of your counterparts, is a follow, a quick follow-up to that, one of your counterparts, uh, John Mauchery from mm -hmm. UNC School of the Arts, uh, also sat here and said it was probably more important for kids to have an MFA than an MBA. Mm -hmm. And his point was because it makes them think more creatively mm -hmm. than just you know, in a box. Right, it's that creativity. It is that thinking outside the box. So I love the arts. I love the, the fine arts. You know, that does stretch them. And you know, you've gotta be a whole person. You can't just be a person with a job. You've gotta have another side. You gotta bring in the cultural uh, aspect of who you are, the fine arts application. You know, all of that is critical to the, to the development of that young person. We don't wanna just graduate at Appalachian, people that can go out and get a job. We want to graduate people that can go out with a job and yet make a difference in the community where they live. We, we have about 30 seconds left. Quick question. I would just, I would agree with you. I think the arts have a big role in helping mm -hmm. not only people who need the skill sets, but also people who are going to be future leaders. Right. Yeah. Agree. Uh, uh, yeah, we are just about out of time. Is there anything you can do about that flooding in the Boone Mall parking lot? <laughs> At the we slightest can, yeah. drizzle, that place floods. Yes, it does. It, I, I don't think I have any authority over that mall, mall parking lot, but I understand I'm on your team. Yeah. And, and just quickly, uh, the switch to uh, Sunbelt from Southern Conference, is that a good deal for App? I think it'll be a very good deal for App. We were very competitive on the fields, on the courses, on the tracks, but I think that you know, this is a different set of schools to be involved with. I like it from the match with academics. Yeah. You know, basically, they were small privates, but now we're into a different region. Uh, Dr. Peacock, thank you for your service and your leadership you. up there. And thank you for being on the program again. Good to thank see you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Molly, nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks, thank Chris. You. Hal, always nice to see Chris, you. Thank great you. to see you as well. Till next week, good night. 
Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.